in, in retrospect and prospect, uh, the, the idea of, of looking back at it as, as things were unfolding in Joel's day that would, that would have a clear ju judgment overtones and the anticipation of the ultimate day of the Lord. Look at in, in the book of Joel, Joel chapter 2, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 11, verse 11 and then verses 28 and 29. If you'd stand with me as I read this. First of all, chapter 2, verse 11. The Lord utters his voice before his army, for his camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? Hear that, that language there, how, uh, this idea of the day of the Lord. It's a, it's a terrible, it's an awesome day. Make you tremble when you think about it. And then verses 28 and 29. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. It's, you, you read that and you recognize Peter cited that at Pentecost as an explanation to what was going on in that phenomenal day. This we've read together what? The inerrant, infallible, all-sufficient word of God. Let's Let's receive it tonight, this overview of Joel, and help, help us to apply it in our own lives. Thank you. Be seated. Michelle, would you show us the video now? The book of the prophet Joel. It's a short collection of prophetic poems that are both powerful and puzzling. Joel is unique among the prophets for a few reasons. First of all, there's no explicit indication of when this book was written. It's most likely the period of Ezra and Nehemiah after the return from the exile because he mentions Jerusalem and the temple, but there doesn't seem to be any kings. Also unique is that Joel is clearly familiar with many other scriptural books. He alludes to or quotes from the prophets Isaiah, Amos, Zephaniah, Nahum, Obadiah, Ezekiel, Malachi, even the book of Exodus. And this is connected with the last unique feature, and that's that Joel never accuses Israel of any specific sin. So, like many of the other prophets, he announces that God's judgment is coming to confront Israel's sin, but he never says why. And that's most likely because Joel assumes that, like him, you have been reading the books of the prophets, and so you already know all about Israel's rebellion. Now, altogether, these three features help us understand this fascinating little book, that Joel is a biblical author who was himself immersed in earlier biblical writings, and his reflection on them helped him make sense of the tragedy of his day, but also they gave him hope for the future. Let's dive in and we'll see how this book works. In chapters 1 and 2, Joel focuses on the day of the Lord. This is a key theme in the prophets, and it describes events in the past when God appeared in a powerful way to save his people or confront evil. Think about the plagues in the book of Exodus. But the prophets saw in these past events pointers to a future time when God would again confront evil among his people, but also among the nations and bring salvation to the whole world. And so here in chapters one and two, Joel has brought two parallel poems together that focus on this theme. So chapter one is about a past day of the Lord. He begins by announcing a recent disaster that a locust swarm has devastated Israel. And his description of the swarm recalls the day of the Lord against Egypt. Remember the eighth plague from Exodus chapter 10. Except this time, the locusts are being sent against Israel. And so Joel calls on the elders and the priests to lead the people in repentance and prayer. And then Joel actually himself repents along with all of the priests. Chapter 2 comes alongside, and it has the same poetic design and flow of thought. So Joel announces another day of the Lord, except this time it's future, not past. It's an imminent disaster coming on Jerusalem. And he begins describing what seems like another wave of locusts, but he uses military and cosmic imagery. So the locusts become God's army, like cavalry and soldiers that are marching and destroying everything in their path. And the sun is darkened, and the earth quakes, and Joel says, the day of the Lord, it's dreadful. Who can endure it? And so once more, Joel calls on the people to pray and repent. And he says how. 
to rend your hearts, not your garments, and return to your God. In other words, Joel knows that repentance can be just a show that you put on to get out of trouble. And he says God's not interested in that. He wants genuine change for his people to stop their selfishness and evil. And then Joel says why Israel should repent, because God is gracious and compassionate. He's slow to anger and he's full of love. He's quoting here from the book of Exodus about how God forgave Israel after they made the golden calf. And from that story, Joel learned that God's mercy and love is more powerful than his wrath and judgment. And so he leads the priests in acts of repentance and prayer, asking God to spare his people. Then right after these two poems, the scene shifts, and we have a short narrative about God's response to the repentance of Joel and the people. So God was filled with passion for his land, and he had pity on his people. And then God says he's going to reverse the devastating effects of this day of the Lord and turn it from judgment into salvation. So first he's going to defeat the threatening invaders, which were presumably the locusts, and he's going to turn them all away to their own ruin. Then he's going to restore the devastated land and bring it back to life, making it abundant once more. And finally, God says he's going to bring his divine presence among his people. It will become real and accessible to everyone. Now up to this point, the poems tell a powerful story about Joel leading Israel to see how their sin led to disaster and divine judgment and that with the God of mercy there is always hope. But Joel sees in all of these past events an image of the future day of the Lord. And so in the final section of the book, Joel writes three more poems that match God's three-part response. And he weaves together images from other prophetic books and expands it all into a vision of hope for all creation. So first, the hope of God's presence among his people gets expanded into a promise about how one day in the future, God's own spirit, his personal life presence, will fill not just the temple, but all of his people. And here Joel is drawing upon the promises of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel that God's spirit would come to transform and empower his people so that they can truly love and follow him. Joel then picks up God's promise that he'll confront the threatening invader. And Joel sees in these ravaging locusts a similarity to the arrogant, violent nations of his own day that ravage and oppress people. And so he draws upon the promises of Isaiah and Zephaniah and Ezekiel about the future day of the Lord, when God will confront evil among all the nations and turn their violence back on themselves, bringing justice to right all wrongs. And finally, Joel picks up the images of the land's restoration, and he sees here a hope for the renewal of all creation. So he draws on the promises of Isaiah and Ezekiel and Zechariah that God's final day of justice will be followed by a restoration of the entire world, a new Eden, where God's presence in Jerusalem will flow out like a river and bring about cosmic renewal. And so Joel's poem ends with God's forgiveness and mercy opening up a whole new creation. And so this little book of Joel, it explores profound ideas about how human sin and failure wreak such devastating destruction in our world, about how God longs to show mercy to those who will just own up to their sin and confess it, and about how all of that leads us to hope that God will one day defend defeat evil in our world, but also inside of us, and bring his healing presence to make all things new. And that's what the book of Joel is all about. Another excellent summary. Uh, we may take issue with his dating, which is, we haven't done much, but, but I think overall he kept, captures the essence of the prophecy. So let's Let's dive in now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, when you come to read Joel, it's, it's short, but, uh, but we don't need to despise that or think it's not significant because he does, though he's not the first one to introduce the term Day of the Lord, he does introduce this idea of, of where all history is heading. He, uh, he takes this, this calamity in the nation of Judah, the southern kingdom. Remember, Judah is the southern kingdom. Uh, and he teaches that historic reality that they would know about, <clears throat> uh, about what they can anticipate if they don't turn to the Lord, what anybody can anticipate if they don't turn to the Lord. 
And in this locust invasion, grape vines are stripped clean, grain fields lay bare. As, as, the, as the video mentioned, it, when you read it, it reminds you of what happened in the Exodus when God was bringing the plagues upon, upon Egypt. Fruit trees, leafless and unproductive. Uh, it, made, it made the grain offerings to God impossible. And he says that as bad as that was, as, as the complete uh, agricultural devastation and the implications of that for the people was that it did not compare to what God was about to bring upon his people. That an army from the north would come to attack the nation uh, and leave behind a devastation more complete than even that of the locusts. Excuse me. The only hope for Joel's hearers as he teaches them is the heartfelt uh, repentance before that terrible day arrives. So let's look at a survey of Joel. See how it breaks down, then we'll go into that in a little more detail as we've done in the past. When you look at Joel, I think it, it takes place in the southern kingdom around 835 B.C., which is a different dating than what the video implied a while ago. Uh, you have from chapter 1-1 to chapter 120, it's the, the day of the Lord in retrospect. He's, he's citing this historical invasion of locusts. Uh, talks about that. The, it's a, there's a, it was the locust came, the drought followed. Then he moves from chapter 2 1 through uh, 321, the, the day of the Lord in prospect, what they can anticipate, this, uh, this future judgment, which would be followed by restoration. So you have this, the imminent day of the Lord and the ultimate day of the Lord. Now I've told you before about prophecy that you have this term proleptic, that, that oftentimes a prophecy will happen, uh, un unfold in some manner of fulfillment shortly after the prophecy, but maybe the ultimate fulfillment comes sometime in the future. And this, this, uh, this prophecy of the day of the Lord fits in that. So uh, you open up with chapter 1, verse 15, alas for the day. Now notice, and Joel uses this term over and over, day of the Lord. For the day of the Lord is near, and as destruction from the Almighty it comes. He says in chapter 2, verse 1, blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is near, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains a great and powerful people. Their light has never been seen before, nor will it be again uh, after them through the years uh, of all generations. And so this warning that God will bring judgment upon his people as they continue to receive his blessings and be unrepentant uh, in the face of his, of his warnings. <clears throat> Chapter 2, verse 11, we read is one of our verses. The Lord utters his voice before his army. His camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful. But the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? And then again in chapter 2, verse 31, the sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. So this, this is a, a cataclysmic catastrophe when you use that kind of language. The, the sun turned to darkness. Uh, they would see that, by the way, for a season, for a brief time period on the day that Jesus is crucified when, when they experience utter darkness at midday when the sun should have been at full, at full shining. And then the moon to blood, the, side of the, the idea of a blood moon and uh, uh, turning red and casting a red pale over everything. And then in chapter 3, verse 14, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. It's interesting, this, this, this image, the valley of decision. The people have been warned and warned and called upon and called upon. And now, now God uh, acts. And he, has, he is demonstrating a decisive action. Chapter 3, verse 18. In that day the mountains shall drip sweet wine, the hills shall flow. Now here's the restoration language coming. With milk and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. And a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and water, uh, from, and water the valley of Shittim. Throughout this, I hope you've recognized as we've gone through a lot of books now that God blesses, the people uh, take it upon themselves and, and become complacent in the face of his blessing. He warns of their need to repent, particularly when they turn away to false gods and, or, or bring in 
uh, sort of a syncretism in the worship of, of the true living God. And he warns and he warns. And he, he never leaves them, though, with the notion of utter devastation not to be recovered. So here this language is mixed in of language of restoration and recovery. So this picture uh, anticipated is a time of, of awesome judgment upon people and nations that have rebelled against God. So it's not just the people of God. Uh, we've looked at other pop prophets where the, where the enemies who come to rise up against the people of God themselves will be, will be seriously punished. But disaster, the idea of disaster runs all through uh, this prophecy. Whether it's locust plagues or famine or fires or invading armies or some kind of uh, phenomena in the heavens, that the sun and moon, uh, pictures of disaster, uh, but promises of hope interspersed, as we said, with the pronouncements of judgment. And so you have uh, this retrospect, that's why the, the outline uses these terms, this retrospect, what, what they have tasted, they've tasted a measure of that, but they're going to see a greater measure if they don't repent. Uh, so the locust plague account is given. And then, uh, then the coming utter day, which we cited in, in Joel 2.11. Uh, still not too late, when, as, the, as the prophet makes his appeal, for the people to avert disaster. Uh, when the Lord says, uh, look, at, look at chapter 2, verses 12 to 17. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. And rend your hearts and not your garments. The idea of, you know, if you know the picture here, that, that a symbol of mourning uh, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament too was that you would, a person would tear their garment. They would, uh, they would rend the garment. That's uh, of, great, of great grief. And here he's saying, it's just going through the motion for too many of you. Rend your hearts. May your hearts be torn over this. A picture of repentance. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. He relents over disaster. He does not repent as a man repents, but God grieves over, over even, even having to send his prophets to send warnings of disaster. He takes, one of the prophets says, as I live, says, I just take no delight in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn. And so that's something of the, of the unchanging character of God. People get confused about this. They you read in the Exodus, it, it repented God that he had done. He's not, he doesn't change his mind. Our repentance is, is a change of mind, change of heart. God doesn't change his mind. He's, he's steadfast. He's the same yesterday, today, and for, forever. Verse 14, who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, Consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room in the brighter chamber. In other words, all need to come and confess uh, their, their failure of, of loving God and following God. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? And this, this theme comes up in the Psalms, comes up in the New Testament. Uh, but sadly, as you read, you know the history, all of these overtures from God fall on deaf ears of the people. And so in this, uh, this day of the Lord at retrospect, this, this locust plague comes, uh, Joel 1, 4 says, what the cutting locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the hopping locust has eaten. And what the hopping locust left, the destroying locust has eaten. So you have these waves of the locust plague coming through and just eating, consuming, devastating, laying waste to the land. In chapter 2, verse 29, 25, I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, the cutter, my great army, which I sent among you. Notice this now. This, this is the prophet speaking and God saying, yeah, the plague of locusts, I sent them. They were my army to get your attention. But the promise is that judgment will be followed by great blessings. So look at Joel chapter 2, verses 18 to 27. And the Lord became jealous for his land and had pity on his people. The Lord answered and said to his people, 
Behold, I'm sending to you again wine and oil, and you will be satisfied, and I will no more make you a reproach among the nations. I will remove the northerner far from you, drive him into a parched and desolate land, his vanguard into the eastern sea, his rear guard into the western sea. The stench and foul smell of him will rise, for he has done great things. Fear not, O land. Be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done great things. Fear not, you beast of the field, for the pastures of the wilderness are green. The tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and vine give their full yield. Be glad, O children of Zion. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for he has given the early rain for your vindication. He has poured down for you abundant rain, the early and latter rain as before. The threshing floors shall be full of grain. The vats shall overflow with wine and oil. I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten, the hopper, the destroyer, and the cutter, my great army which I sent among you. You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied, and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never again be put to shame. You shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, that I am the Lord your God, and there is none else, and my people shall never again be put to shame. So there's this we have to be careful here. People, people that are not reading to see the glory of God will read something like this and say, wow, God sure is fickle. I mean, on the one hand, he brings all this, and now it looks like he's got, it's almost like a, uh, an angry father remorse, you know, where a dad, a dad corrects his children, spanks them, perhaps spanks them in anger, and says, oh, you know, like, look, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be okay. It's going to be better than it ever was before. That's not what we're dealing with here. We're dealing with a with a, a faithful, consistent resolve of God to apply to his people the necessary measure of discipline to, to wean them from their false gods, to wean them from the error of their ways, and then to put out the hope of, of the promise of restoration, the promise that, that they will, uh, the notion, to, to rescue them from the notion, well, all our, all our great days are behind us. That's not how God works. According to the, to the covenant language, their best days are ahead of them, but you cannot anticipate the best days under God and yet be uh, complacent about his blessings. And then the next verses, chapter 2, verses 28 to 33, and you, you'll recognize these. These are probably some of the most recognizable verses in Joel. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days I will pour out my spirit. I will show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord. There's that term again, comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. And so there's this, this promise of hope, and the, and the prophets speak it, and the New Testament writers uh, connect it to the inauguration of, of the new covenant and the culmination of the end of the age uh, with the promise that whoever, whatever the devastation be, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then you've, that's chapter 2. In chapter 3, you, you have this. Uh, in chapter 3, verse 14, right, we read it earlier. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. The day of the Lord is near the valley of decision. The, the nations in this great ultimate day of the Lord, the nations will give an account of themselves to Israel, to the God of Israel, who judges all who rebel. We told you earlier when we were studying the, the major prophets, God at one point says, I'll raise up my king, Nebuchadnezzar. And he uses Nebuchadnezzar to take his people captive. Then he punishes Nebuchadnezzar for being so harsh toward his people. That is the, that is the sovereign, awe-inspiring mystery of God. That he can use uh, pagan rulers to bring his people under his sway. And then in uh, God controls the course of history, Joel 3, 17. So you shall know that I am the Lord your God who dwells in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. And then the promise uh, on the faithful remnant of Judah, Joel 3, 20. Be 
But Judah shall be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem to all generations. Not only necessarily the, the geographical area, but particularly the spiritual, uh, that his people will, uh, will be inhabitants of his place. And so that's kind of a survey, an overview of how, how the book flows. As far as the, uh, the introduction and title of it, uh, the title, uh, the Hebrew name, Yoel, you, you hear in that, of course, Yah, Yael, means Yahweh is God. And, you, and Yahweh, we've talked about these names of God before. Yahweh comes from the Hebrew verb of being, Hayah, which means was, is, is to come. And then El, the, uh, the name of God that you find back in Genesis and, and the early, early writings of the Bible. So, so Yael, Yahweh is God. That's the name. And of course, the book emphasizes God's sovereign work in history. He tells them what he's going to do. Uh, they don't get to have any input in this. Uh, their call is to repent. The uh, courses of nature so that you can take up locust plagues. And he just uses them just like he did in the days of, uh, of Egypt leading to the Exodus. The Greek name uh, is, is Yoel. And so we get our word Joel from that. As far as the author, it is, it's, uh, there are several Joels in the Bible. Uh, the only thing we know of this Joel is what we find in this book. He identifies himself as the son of, of, uh, of Pethuel, which means persuaded by God or persuaded of God. Uh, he uses about nine times in the book these references to Zion and the house of the Lord. Uh, but he probably lived uh, in, the, in the proximity of Jerusalem. He, he makes some references, and I want to show you these, in chapter 1, 13 and 14, and chapter 2, 17 of the, of the priests, and that, that these become a source of discussion in terms of timing. But look at what he says, and, and it makes you wonder if he, he himself was not only a prophet, but was also of the priestly background. Chapter 1, 13 and 14, put on sackcloth and lament, O priests, wail, O ministers of the altar, go in, pass the night in sackcloth, O ministers of my God. Because grain offering and drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. We gather the elders and all the inhabitants of the land to the house of your God. Cry out to the Lord. Then in chapter 2, verse 17, between the vestibule. And we read this a while ago. I just want, I want you to see this in the context of identifying the author. And the altar, let, us, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, spare your people, O Lord. So... It makes you wonder, those who study these things very closely, wonder, was Joel a priest who was called by God to prophesy about this, the coming day of the Lord? Uh, he clearly, though, whatever is, he clearly preaches repentance in an unmistakable way. Now, the date and setting, and this is where people differ. We, the folks on the video, we would differ with them. Look, I'm going to give you some... some challenges you face when you're dating this book. There is no explicit time references in this book, whereas in others we've been able to pinpoint things mentioned to a particular time. Um, some assign it a late date uh, for these reasons. It would be post-exilic is what it's called, so after the exiles. One, first of all, it does not mention the northern kingdom and indicates it was written after 722 B.C., the demise of Israel. So the, the absence of the mention of the Nor northern kingdom makes you wonder, did it exist at that time? Was it already uh, taken captive? Second, the references to priests but not kings fit the post-exilic period. Why, why aren't the kings mentioned? Third, uh, Joel does not refer to Assyria, Syria, or Babylon. Uh, perhaps these countries have already been overthrown. Uh, fourth, if chapter 3, verse 2 refers to the Babylonian captivity, then this would also support the post-exilic date. Look at chapter 3, verse 2. I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and divided up my land. 
So it makes you, it's one of those things that gives you pause, makes you wonder. Fifth, the mention of the Greeks argues for a late date in, in Joel 3, 6. You've sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks in order to remove them far from their own border. So that would be the arguments that people would, would marshal to say, this is, a, this is after the exiles uh, the, in, in 722, uh, in 586. But there are others who believe Joel was written in the ninth century. And they argue these things. First, Joel's failure to mention the northern kingdom is an argument from silence. In other words, the fact that he doesn't say anything about it doesn't mean that it wasn't there. Uh, his prophecy was directed to Judah, to the southern kingdom, not Israel. Second, other early prophets omit references to a king. We're going to be looking at these, Obadiah, coming up pretty soon, Jonah, Nahum, Habakkuk. Uh, this also fits the political situation during 841 to 835 B.C. when, when Adaliah usurped the throne upon the death of her husband Ahaziah. Uh, Joash, Joash, the legitimate heir to the throne, was a, was a, a minor. He was underage and protected by the high priest Jehoiada. When Athaliah was removed from power in 835, Joash came to the throne but ruled under the, the regency of Jehoiada. So perhaps the prominence of the priests and lack of reference to the king in Joel fit this historical context that Jehoiada would have been taking care of this young, uh, this young king. So just arguments here. Third, it's true that Joel does not refer to Assyria or Babylonia. But the countries Joel mentions are more crucial. They're Phoenicia, Philistia, Egypt, Edom. Uh, countries that were prominent in the ninth century, but not later. So there's one of the arguments that says, why would these have been brought up? I mean, their prominence was in the ninth century. Assyria and Babylonia are not mentioned because they had not yet reached a position of power. Also, if, if Joel were post-exilic, after the exiles, uh, a reference to Persia would be expected. So then you go back to chapter 3, verse 2 that we read earlier. Uh, does not refer to the Babylonian captivity, but to an event that has not yet occurred. So it's, you know, it's spoken in terms of a futuristic prophecy. Fifth, Greeks are mentioned in Assyrian records from the 8th century B.C. It's just an assumption to state that the Hebrews had no knowledge of the Greeks at an early time. Um, so then here's another thing that happens when you're trying to date this, that, that Joel and Amos... Uh, appear to, to share material. I want you to look at these com comparisons here. Joel 3.16 says, The Lord roars from Zion and utters His voice from Jerusalem, and the heavens and the earth quake. But the Lord is a refuge to His people, a stronghold to the people of Israel. Well, look at Amos 1.2. And He said, The Lord roars from Zion and utters His voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn, and the top of Carmel withers. Another comparison here, Joel 3.18. In that day the mountains shall drip sweet wine, the hills shall flow with milk, all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water, and a fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and water the valley of Shittim. Amos 9.13, look at this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes and him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. So it when you see those kind of things, doing some comparison, it gives you pause. Well, perhaps, perhaps these uh, happen about the same time. So the context suggests that Amos, who was an 8th century prophet, borrowed from Joel. And Joel's style is more like that of Hosea and Amos than of the writers after the exile, the post-exilic writers. And for that reason, the, the materials that I was gathering favor a, a date about 835 B.C., which differs again with the video, but that's it's okay. We're not going to go to war over it. It just seems like that's a better fit when you take all things into consideration. Joel does not mention idolatry. Uh, so it may have been written after the, after the purge of Baal worship and most of the other forms of idolatry uh, during the early reign of Joash under Jehoiada. As an early prophet of Judah, Joel would have been a contemporary, and I thought this was interesting, contemporary of Elisha in Israel. If indeed we, put, we place the date of, of the book of Joel around 835. 
What about the theme? It's not going to surprise you that the theme uh, is the day of the Lord. Uh, we've read these passages. I don't, want to, I don't want to just wear you out with them, but I just want to cite them so that you can hear the language here. Uh, the, 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 remind you, the locust plague becomes an illustration of what's coming. And they'll, they'll be this way. Remember the locust plague? That's nothing compared to what's coming. So it's a point of reference there. Um, but the promise comes in Joel 2.32. It shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Of course, Paul the Apostle picks this up in Romans. It becomes a, one of the great redemptive hopes that no matter how far afield the people of God have gone, no matter how on a, on a downward spiral the culture has gone, no matter how the church struggles in a particular age and time, it is still true. It's true today that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The day of salvation is still offered. And that's the, that's the message of hope. Uh, the, Joel was written, this theme of the day of the Lord was written to, to warn the people of their need to humble themselves and turn to the Lord with repentant hearts. And we, we read this. I won't go back over it. I just will cite a little bit of Joel 2, 12 to 17. I, I hope you'll, you'll kind of meditate upon some of these passages. Even now declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. And so he, this, this comprehensive call to everyone. No one, no one is immune. Bring the nursing infants. Bring the newlywed couple in the, in the bridal chamber. All come before the Lord. The priests need to come and repent. So it's comprehensive. Um, and, the, and the tone there is that God would prefer to bless rather than to punish. He would prefer to prosper rather than to devastate. But he responds to his people as they have need when they turn away from him. Um, what about keys? Some of the keys to, to understanding this, little, this brief prophecy. Well, again, it sounds redundant, but the, the day of the Lord. You need to understand the day of the Lord. By the way, this comes into play in, in, in Revelation 1, verse 10. When, when John is beginning to unfold his experience, he says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And when you look at that, it's the, it's in, the, in the language, it's the day of the Lord. It's just called the Lord's day for, for brevity. It's the day of the Lord. Well, what is the day of the Lord? Well, in this prophecy, there's retrospect. There have been those coming in, of, uh, comings of God in judgment to show the ultimate coming in judgment, the end of the age. And for the new covenant, watch this. For the new covenant, it's not so much calamity upon a national people, though calamity can come. Rather, it is the weekly observance of something that came to be named the Lord's Day. It's the weekly observance to come and to gather on the day of resurrection, to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus over the grave, to not only commemorate that and remember that and be blessed by that, but also to anticipate the return of the Lord. I'm going to submit to you that this present generation of Christians in the West is, is lazy and fuzzy and complacent about the day of the Lord because of the attitude about the Lord's day. You can't, you can't be sharply focused, keenly aware. If you're ignoring the very, uh, one of the very tools God has given his church to stay ready, to stay ready. In fact, I would challenge anybody who suggests to me that they're ready for the return of Jesus, who, who ignores the gathering of the people of Jesus on the day of the Lord, the Lord's day. It's just, it's, it's impossible. It's incoherent. It doesn't connect. And so uh, it makes you wonder uh, 
I just do this as a pastor sometimes, not just about these people. I mean, there's, I'd love to think everybody who's not here tonight is at home having devotions. I'm not naive. I wasn't born yesterday, didn't fall off a pumpkin truck. That's not what's happening. And so there's a complacency about this. And it makes you wonder, because this is, this is wholesale, it's across the board in the West. What will have to happen to this generation if the, if the instructions, the clear example of Christ, and instructions in the New Testament, but gathering on the first day of the week, if that does not stir in the people a zeal uh, to provoke one another to love and good works and anticipate, as Paul says or in Hebrews, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. And he goes on down, he says, and so much the day, so much the more as the day is coming. What's he talking about then when he says the day is coming? The Lord's day, the day of the Lord, the ultimate day of the Lord. And so uh, while I recognize and that there's providential hinderings, there are people uh, ill and, and otherwise uh, engaged, and that's, not the, that's not the preponderant truth of the habitual absence from gathering of the people of God on the Lord's day. It's a complacence. Uh, I think it's a presumption. C.S. Lewis said, time, said one time, why would people think heaven is going to be so wonderful and that they'd be there if they, if they habitually ignore gathering with the people of God on earth on the first day of the week, which is supposed to be a taste of heaven? Why deceive yourself like that? And so this, this idea of the day of the Lord is a very important picture. And it shifts, the emphasis of it shifts under the new covenant to this uh, not to an occasional calamity from an invading army or a, or a uh, what will be an entomological calamity, bugs consuming everything, but the regular weekly observance to remember the resurrection of Jesus and anticipate the return of Jesus, which is why we gather on the first day of the week. So the day of the Lord is the, is the key phrase. The key verses we read at the beginning, I'll not read them again. I'll just simply cite them. Joel 2.11, Joel 2, 28 and 29. Uh, the key chapter, of course, it wouldn't surprise you, is Joel 2. Uh, a lot of information there. And again, verses 13 and 14, capture that, rend your hearts, not your garments. Um, when we see that now, then how do we see Jesus in Joel? Well, let's look at that for a few minutes. Jesus promised to send the Holy Spirit after he had ascended back to the Father. Look at, just, just read these passages together here. One is just one verse, another is about, about uh, eight verses. John 16, 7 to 15. Let's look at that together. This is Jesus in that, in that upper room discourse. John gives, John's the only one who gives us this extended material from John uh, 13 on uh, to, the, uh, to the trial, the arrest of the trial of Jesus' teaching. And he says in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes... He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. Concerning sin because they do not believe in me. Concerning righteousness because I go to the Father and you'll see me no longer. Concerning judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. And he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said to you that he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So the Spirit's going to come. He's going to teach the people to, to uh, glorify Jesus, love Jesus. He's going to teach the people to anticipate uh, the coming of the end. Look at Acts 1.8, the, uh, one of the commissioning passages. He's told them it's not given to you to know the times and the season. The Father's kept that in his own power. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria to the end of the earth. This, this anticipation of how the church will move forward. Now, this is the teaching of Jesus. Look, look what Joel speaks of in Joel 2, 28 to 32. 
Peter preaches about it. We're going to see Peter's words in a few minutes. It shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons, your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. I will show wonders in the heavens, on the earth, <clears throat> excuse me, and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. <clears throat> All right. Look at Acts 2, 16 to 21. Peter's told the folks, these folks are not drunk as you suppose. Verse 16, but this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And he cites that passage there. So he quotes right what we just read from Joel, the same thing when you look at that there. He said, what you're seeing here at Pentecost is a fulfillment of what Joel prophesied some eight, nine hundred years before. Joel gives us a picture of Jesus as one who's going to judge the nations in the, in the valley of Jehoshaphat. We read that earlier, but look at this again. Joel 3.2 and Joel 3.12. I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat, and I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my heritage Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations and have divided up my, my land. Verse 12. Let the nations stir themselves up and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Jesus is set forth in Joel as the one who is at the very center of the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is his day, his day to come in judgment, his day to come to settle all matters, to vindicate his people from those who've been their enemies, to vindicate the faithful from those who have, who have masqueraded and pretended to be among the people who are not. And it's gonna be all about, about Jesus at that time. Well, what is Joel's uh, contribution to the Bible, to the whole literature of Scripture? Uh, one writer said this. I think he said that Joel is characterized by a graphic style and vivid descriptions. Of course, they're talking about the, the pictures of the, of the locust plague. Striking use of historical event as an illustrative foundation for the overall message of the book. And although Obadiah was the first prophet to mention the day of the Lord. Look at Obadiah 15 with me. For the day of the Lord is near upon all the nations. As you have done, it shall be done to you. Your deeds shall return on your own head. So, so that, that term comes first from the prophet Oziah, chronolo Obadiah, chronologically speaking. Joel is the first to take it and develop the idea uh, to the extent that, that Peter can cite it when he's preaching from Acts 2 at Pentecost. Uh, so he develops it as an important biblical theme, and then it's, it shows up in other prophetic writings. Look at, let's just look at some of these real quickly from Isaiah and, and Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Amos, Zephaniah, Malachi, and then a couple of places in the New Testament. Let's look at these. Isaiah 2.12, For the Lord of hosts has a day against all that is proud and lofty, against all that is lifted up, and it shall be brought low. So, so Isaiah speaks of this day that the Lord has. Isaiah 2, 17 to 20. And the haughtiness of man shall be humbled, and the lofty pride of men shall be brought low, and the Lord alone will be exalted in that day. And the idols shall utterly pass away, and the people shall enter the caves of the rocks and the holes of the ground from before the terror of the Lord. So the, see the connection, the day of the Lord, a day of a, a terrible and awesome day. And from the splendor of his majesty, when he rises to terrify the earth. And that day mankind will cast away their idols of silver and their idols of gold, which they made for themselves to worship, to the moles and to the bats. In other words, they will surrender them to the, to the uh, creatures who, who live in caves under the ground. Chapter 3, verse 7 to 18. In that day he will speak out, saying, I will not be a healer. In my house there is neither bread nor cloak. You shall not make me leader of the people. For Jerusalem has stumbled, Judah has fallen, because their speech and their deeds are against the Lord, defying his glorious presence. For the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. 
Tell the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for what his hands have dealt out shall be done to him. My people, infants are their oppressors. Women rule over them. O oh, my people, your guides mislead you, and they've swallowed up the course of your paths. The Lord has taken his place to contend. He stands to judge peoples. The Lord will enter into judgment with the elders and princes of his people. It is you who have devoured the vineyard. The spoil of the poor is in your houses. What do you mean by crushing my people, by grinding the face of the poor, declares the Lord God of hosts. The Lord said, because the daughters of Zion are haughty and walk with outstretched necks, glancing wantonly with their eyes, mincing along as they go, tinkling with their feet. Therefore, the Lord will strike with a scab the heads of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will lay bare their secret parts. In that day, the Lord will, make, will take away the finery of the anklets, the headbands, the crescents. Then again, this, this language here, we're going to look at something in a few minutes, but I mean, this is terrifying language. Anybody who's not just, just completely dulled and in a stupor will hear this and have something of an arresting going on with them in that day. Chapter 4, seven women shall take hold of one man in that day, saying, We will eat our own bread and wear our own clothes. Only let us be called by your name. Take away our reproach. In that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the land shall be, pride, shall be the pride and honor of the survivors of Israel. So this contrast here of how the Lord is going to bless the righteous, but how he will bring to ruin the wicked. Chapter 13 of Isaiah. Verses 6 to 9, wail, for the day of the Lord is near. I see, when we started out in Isaiah, the early ver the day, that day. Now there's this, the day of the Lord is near. As destruction from the Almighty, it will come. Therefore, all hands will be feeble, and every human heart will melt. They will be dismayed. Pangs and agony will seize them. They will be in anguish like a woman in labor. They will look aghast at one another. Their faces will be aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord comes, cruel with wrath and fierce anger to make the land a desolation and to destroy its sinners from it. Jeremiah, let's sample Jeremiah here. Chapter 46, verse 10. That day is the day of the Lord God of hosts, a day of vengeance, to avenge himself on his foes. The sword shall devour and be sated and drink its fill of blood. That's the picture there, that the, that the sword will find its mark and blood, drip with blood. For the Lord God of hosts holds a sacrifice in the north country by the river Euphrates. In other words, sacrificing the enemies of God. Ezekiel, a couple of passages here. You have not, this is chapter 13, verse 5. You have not gone up into the breaches or built up a wall for the house of Israel that it might stand in battle in the day of the Lord. And again, chapter 30, verse 3. For the day is near. The day of the Lord is near. It will be a day of clouds, a time of doom for the nations. And then you get to Amos. Uh, We'll be looking at Amos next week, Lord willing. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Amos 5, 18. Woe to you who desire the day of the Lord. Why would you have the day of the Lord? It is darkness and not light. In other words, you, you, the way you're living so flippantly, it will not be a good day for you. Then Zephaniah, a couple of passages from Zephaniah, chapter 1, verse 7. Be silent before the Lord God, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice and consecrated his guests. In verse 14, the great day of the Lord is near, near and hastening fast. The sound of the day of the Lord is bitter. The mighty man cries aloud there. And in Malachi, you come to the end of the Old Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Come. So now you, you, you've got these warnings all through the prophets, and then in Malachi, this extension of Elijah the prophet. Of course, when you, when you begin to interpret these things and see how this unfolded, John the Baptist was considered an Elijah in the, in the Revelation. Uh, there will be two witnesses, and Elijah will be one of them who will come at the end. But you get the flavor of how the day of the Lord is spoken of in, in the Old Testament. It's not a picnic. It's not a picnic. And so what they experience when you think about that, if you, if you put yourself back in the Old Testament period, is they would see these, these waves of temporal judgment come. Different, different levels of them. They experienced it 
throughout the wilderness wanderings. That God is not to be trifled with. He's a holy God. He's given holy commands. He's given Jesus. And he doesn't take it, doesn't take it lightly when anyone spurns Jesus. And he doesn't take it lightly when someone uh, thinks they can have Jesus and have the world too. It's an offense to him when he gave his son as a sacrifice. Well, what about the New Testament? Just real quickly, a couple of things, and we'll wrap this up. Look at 1 Corinthians 5. 5. This is, we've looked at this recently. We mentioned it this morning. It's the, when, when Paul summoned the Corinthian church to deal with the sexually immoral person. Watch the language he used here. You are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Paul says it's better for this man to experience temporal, uh, incredible loss, trouble, trial, tribulation. Suffer what would have been then the humiliation of being told by the people in Corinth, you are no longer recognized as a brother walking in union with Christ. And we're going to do to you what Jesus said to do to you, and that's to treat you as a heathen and a publican. Matthew 18. Why? Why would you do that? Because you mean? No. Because the day of the Lord is coming. More important for this person to be troubled and deeply uncomfortable and even frustrated and perhaps bitter and resentful if through that means he is recovered, which he was if you read 2 Corinthians, early chapters, so that he will be saved in that day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5, 2. For you yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. All these people that write and tell you when the world's going to end, they just they make fools of themselves. If I told you that a thief was going to try to break, I had, I had certainty from on high from God that a thief was going to break into your house Tuesday night, 9.30, would you be anywhere else? Would the police be anywhere else if you took my word? And if it didn't happen, make me a liar, make me a fool, someone not to be believed. Yet people do this kind of stuff all the time. And, and what amazes me is that after it's over, they still have followers. The day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. That's why the scripture says we need to be watchful. I told you my... my one of my New Testament professors, Dr. Thomas Urry, who's gone to be with the Lord now, when we studied 1 Thessalonians, he said, now I'm going to give you a, a three-point infallible bedrock eschatology. The eschatology means the doctrine of last things, the eschaton. He said, here it is, the absolute certainty that Jesus will return bodily, number one. Number two, the absolute uncertainty as to when he will return. Three, the absolute necessity to be found watching and ready when he comes. And that's true. Those are all from the scripture. You cannot deny them. You can hang your hat on them. When the day of the Lord comes, like a thief in the night. If you look at a couple more, 2 Thessalonians 2, 2, and 2 Peter 3.10, that this is a, it's a future thing that we're talking about here. 2 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, not to be quickly shaken in mind or alarmed either by a spirit or a spoken word or a letter seeming to be from us to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. In other words, Paul says, if anybody's written to you and told you it's already happened, don't let that shake you. It's not true. 2 Peter 3.10, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief and the heavens will pass away with a roar. And the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Of course, Peter quoted Joel. We mentioned that uh, in his sermon. When Jesus was teaching in what we call the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, uh, he associates the events referenced in Joel. We'll look at these in a minute with signs of his second coming. Look at this. In Matthew 24, 29, he says, 
Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Okay? Jesus teaching this. Joel 2.10. The earth quakes before them, the heavens tremble, the sun and the moon are darkened, and the stars withdraw their shining. Joel 2.31. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon to blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Joel 3.15, the sun and moon are darkened, the stars withdraw their shining. So we're talking about the contribution of Joel to the Bible. Jesus alludes to it, Peter, uh, Paul, reference it. And then in Romans 10, 12 to 13, of course, the, if you look at that, no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing rich riches on all who call on Him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. He takes that directly out of Joel. And I want to go one other place. I don't think I put this in the slide. I want you to go with me to Hebrews chapter 10 before we close. Let's begin in verse 19 to set a little context here. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. There's that picture of the new covenant, the sprinkling of the hearts and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. <clears throat> I've heard people say before, wow, you know, you read that stuff in the Old Testament. And man, I'm, I'm just so glad we live in the New Testament that not have to worry about that. I tell them, you need to read your New Testament more carefully. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Shorthand for what? The day of the Lord. For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversary. What's he talking about? The day of the Lord. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses. Here's where the, here's where the notion of, well, it's a good thing we're not living in the Old Testament. Anyone who set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the evidence of two or three witnesses. And you'd expect verse 29 to say, isn't it a good thing that we live in the new covenant? That's not what he says. How much worse punishment do you think will be deserved by the one who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, has profaned the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, has outraged the spirit of grace? For we know him who said Vengeance is mine. Not vengeance was mine. Vengeance is mine. I will repay. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. One of the later books written in the New Testament. And yet still, and writers typically agree that Paul wrote this or Apollos wrote this. Still, this notion that if, if it happened this way in the Old Testament, under law, how much more under grace? That's the argument. And it totally blows away people's thinking about, about people think under grace you just get away with all that. No. How much more? And the, and the descriptive language here. What was seen in the Old Testament? Breaking the law of God. 
What's sin in the New Testament? Trampling underfoot the Son of God. Treating the blood of the covenant as a, as a meaningless thing. Uh, mocking the Spirit. And so, I, I, again, I'm closing this up with you to say that we need today, we need, we need a revival in our day, in this day, of a sense of the sober reality that whenever the day of the Lord is going to take place, it is closer today than it was yesterday. And while our uh, forebears who lived in, in centuries past, millennia past, saw these tokens, these demonstrations, locusts and, and all these things that have come upon them as, as demonstrations of, of, a, of a visitation of the day of the Lord. They did not live to see what is coming. And I'm not a prophet and the son of a prophet. I'm not going to tell you that you and I are going to live to see what is coming because I, I don't know if we'll live that long. I don't know when it's coming. But I do know that we're told to be ready. And I think we need a revival in our day of a sense of the holiness of the day of the Lord. And here's one of the things that will tip us off on this. We'll see that revival. We'll know it's coming. When, when the new covenant expression of that, the Lord's day, undergoes a transformation of it meaning more to people than it means right now. If we were going to write, rewrite the scripture, we'd have to rewrite it and say, the Lord's hour and a half. No, it's the Lord's day. And so, so Joel teaches us that if we, will, if we will be taught by the Spirit concerning the context of this, and it gives us the picture, and of course, you've all the preponderance of Scripture that piles on with it. Any questions or comments before we, before we dismiss?